this week on the WriterCon podcast. You know, people always ask you, you know, like, or they say, oh, you're not going to make money writing books. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and I always tell people when you write, uh, and, and my response to that comment is that I'm making me. Uh, I have to make me. And, and when you're writing, you're making yourself. And, and really having that, that, if you're thinking about, I'm just doing it not to make me, but to make money, well, why are you doing it? You're making yourself, so. Welcome to WriterCon, a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world. Your hosts are William Bernhardt, best-selling novelist and author of the Red Sneaker Books on Writing, and Laura Bernhardt, award-winning author of the Wantlin Files book series. Hey there, writers. Thanks for joining me and Laura and Jesse. This episode is going out on Oscar Sunday. So many minds may be turning to the movies rather than books. But since this is the WriterCon podcast, you know I'm not going to go that direction. Here's a fact you may or may not have known. Fully 75%, in fact, a little bit over 75% of all films that have ever won the Best Picture Oscar were based on books or plays. That's 75%, which might make you wonder why these glam movie awards get so much attention and the books they are almost completely dependent upon do not. Jesse, do you have a theory on this? Yeah, because the the way movies are created writing wise is never designed to actually make something that is great. Well, books are designed to be made great. And so using those as the source material <laughs> is going to make a better story because it has a direction. It has a beginning, has a middle, has an end. Yeah. Plus, you know, I, I like film and I was interested in that in school too, but at the end of the day, I thought you make a movie, you need hundreds of people. I can write a book by myself, so I'm going to write books. <laughs> but remember, people get excited about the actors that they feel like they know. Those actors come into the theater with them and into their homes with them, and they hear them talking. As we, when do we see writers? Authors are are not the ones who are coming into your living room right. and talking was, to you. I was talking to Laura about this yesterday, wasn't I? Because I'm a tiny bit older than she is. And I remember when talk shows tended to go 90 minutes long, you know, Merv and Johnny Carson originally, and they would bring on writers in the last half hour after they'd gone through the stars and things were getting a little slower. You might see, I remember seeing Robin Cook and Michael Crichton and other people and, and that helped boost their careers. But of course you don't see that at all anymore. Hmm. We will be watching the Oscars tonight, though, won't we, Laura? Are you watching with me? Of course. Absolutely. I might even wear a red carpet gown. You never know. Oh, And okay. we'll make tons of snacks. Well, if I can't t- take pictures of the gown, not the snacks, then that'll be on the next <laughs> podcast for sure. <laughs> okay. Our interview today is with Stephen Joseph, who has a rep for being cranky. But fortunately, his books will leave you laughing your cranky little head off. In his latest book, Cranky Superpowers, Stephen dives into the quirky, unexpected aspects of life that get under our skin. We're going to take a deep dive into this book and his related other cranky books (laughs) and his theories about crankiness and how that relates to writers. But first, the news. Our first news story relates to romanticy and in particular to the use of the word smut. Yes, you heard me right. S-M-U-T. Used to be bad, but Gen Z is reclaiming it in a positive way. Let me remind you first, during our New Year's prediction show, remember we forecast the continued rise of the romanticy genre, which... You know, to be fair, it didn't really require a crystal ball. But the genre has ballooned to such an extent now that New York publishers cannot buy it fast enough. And some people are wondering if they're buying anything else. There's also been a fascinating response 
to snob critics continued use of the word the one i just said smut to describe these books basically people saying well all you're really saying is that it has sex scenes and what's wrong with that okay here's my romanticy one-on-one as you probably already figured it out even if you didn't know already that word is a portmanteau of romance and fantasy applied to novels that blend elements of both genres and romanticy authors are selling well, very well right now, in part because of their huge popularity on social media, particularly TikTok. Sarah J. Mass's publisher, which is Bloomsbury, says that the videos with hashtags connected to her books have, wait for this, more than 14 billion views on TikTok alone. Yes, you heard me use the B word, 14 billion of these. Romanticy novels are typically set in fantastic worlds with fairies and dragons and magic and the like, but they also feature what I will call classic romance plot lines, but they also often have explicit sex scenes which are referred to online as spice or maybe that reclaimed word smut. Another author of this genre, Carrie Maniscalco, she's written a book called Throne of the Fallen, says that spicy books allow, quote, a safe space for readers to explore their own fantasies in an unapologetic way. So, Lara, of course, I'm going to turn to you first. What's Mm -hmm. your take? Why are they reclaiming smut and basically saying, hey, what's wrong with that? I want to know if smut was ever applied to a book written by a man. Hmm. Why are we reclaiming that? It's going to take it it back. Yeah, I know the answer to the question. The answer is no. The answer is no. Jesse is absolutely correct. Thank you, Jesse, for answering that question for me. Did we see this applied to... Um, Game of Thrones, those books in his series? Absolutely not. And what they're talking hours. about here is in the romance books where the women are more empowered and the sex is consensual, this is a safe place for us to explore this aspect of our life. Whereas in Game of Thrones, we very often see um, sexual violence within mm-hmm. it. And so why is it that that's, that's considered more okay and yet Mm -hmm. these romance books are smut i'll I'll Mm -hmm. point out as well the word smut originally referred to um the black mess left behind in the chimney that you'd have to clean out of that so the Mm -hmm. the um the dirty the dirty residue that was left over so it's trying to make it into something uh, dirty and gross. And I love that we're taking that back mm-hmm. and saying, that's right, whatever. Um, smut author, smut reader, whatever. We we can be okay with female sexuality, everyone. It's okay. It's okay. Well, it's all a matter of opinion, isn't it? I mean, this, I don't know if anybody used the word smut, but I do very much recall that, uh, you know, when Ulysses by James Joyce now often considered the greatest book of the 20th century, but it initially couldn't be published in the United States because it was considered pornographic because it had sexual content. And Bennett Cerf, owner of Random House at that time, actually had to go to court to get a declaration on this subject. And the judge, you can read the opinion in most copies of Ulysses now, the judge basically says, it's kind of boring, but pornographic? No. <laughs> I actually I actually did read about that case in the paper that I wrote in my legal class when I was working on my degree, where I was talking about book banning and why it's unconstitutional. And that's actually mm-hmm. one of the very first times that that book banning was challenged here in this country. So I probably should have um, stipulated that I was referring more to current um current yeah, time. Well, even but then still, i don't yes. I, I, mean, I mean i think right. you're, things change things change but i think you're totally right though about the smut that's that's something people say that's something some critics say about romance novels because let's face it despite the fact that romance is the most popular genre it is never treated well by critics it is completely ignored by some 
publications like the New York Times, which are now struggling to have a, a decent bestseller list when they don't want to acknowledge the existence of the books that are actually bestsellers. And, but, you know, why has romance fiction always been trashed? It's because it's women, it's fiction by women for women, right? I believe it. And so and it became a disparaging term. Absolutely. You hear, yeah. You hear people talk about trashy romance novels. I mean, compared mm -hmm. to what? Does yeah. anybody say a trashy legal thriller? I mean, some of them are, but you don't hear people saying that, right? All right. News story number two, which has to do with AI audiobooks, something I think both of you can relate to. There's been a lot of talk lately, of course, about AI, and we in the book world are wondering how that's going to be used in the world of books. But clearly, its first prominent appearance is going to be in the world of audiobooks. AI audiobooks, that is, books narrated not by a human being, but by an AI voice, are actually gaining popularity, both with authors and readers. Uh, FYI, if you don't know this already, there are various places where you can get one of these AI narrated books. You can get them at Apple through Draft2Digital, or you can go to Google Play and other places, usually at no additional cost, thus giving you an audiobook without paying for or sharing royalties with a narrator. And now, just to put the final clincher on this, AI narrated audio books are being permitted and officially being sold on all big five retailers, all five of them and many, many others. Of course, what everybody really wants to know is what about Amazon? Since Amazon owns Audible, which commands about, depending on the genre, between 60 or 75% of US and UK audiobook market sales. And the answer there is yes, they are already selling AI narrated audiobooks. And now they've opened a new program. It's in beta right now to help you, you the author, create your own AI audiobooks for use through Amazon and Audible. I'll put the links to the beta site in the show notes so you can see it there. But Laura, mm -hmm. gonna start with you on this since you are an actress and you have narrated many audiobooks. So what do you think about this step, which seems to sidestep human narrators? I am currently AI narrated audiobook curious. <laughs> I have been looking into this. I'm half embarrassed to admit. Um, I've worked very closely with a narrator who I absolutely love. And I find myself thinking, if I was, if it was me narrating my own books, I'd switch in a heartbeat. It would save me a ton of time, and um, that would be a great thing. It would just get that audiobook out there so much faster. With mm -hmm. her in the mix, it makes me wonder, though. Like I don't, I feel like we've developed a friendship, and I feel bad about um, cutting her out of that. Sure. Not that but, she's buying a guest house uh, or a you know vacation home with right. the earnings from it, but you know she's she's an integral part of my process. But there are other um, there are other projects that I think could perhaps benefit mm -hmm. from this. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very interested. I'm intrigued yeah. by the idea, and I've been listening to some of the samples, and I was pretty impressed. Some of the samples, I thought. If I just heard that and you didn't tell me that was an AI, I wouldn't have oh, believed it. Well, that's good. Um, that's, you know, that's the highest compliment you could give something like this. So you didn't think it sounded metallic or you know where each syllable goes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't sound like it's connected to the previous now, one. Granted, the the it's just a few. You know, it's a sh it's it's short clips, and mm -hmm. I think I would maybe want to hear what the whole thing um, sounded like. But sure. um, I had some books where she and I, you know, they're set in other countries, and she and I went back and forth and back and forth. What do we do with the characters who um, are different ethnicities, and we don't want to mimic that? We 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 put a lot of time and discussion and how to mm -hmm. handle that 
um, effectively, but this would enable you to just have it read in, in that particular voice. Right. And, and to be clear, there are some legit business reasons for doing this. Obviously it's going to decrease the cost of creating the audio book. Yes. And uh, it also, I assume, I haven't done it either, but I assume it'll be much quicker since it's all automated. Jesse, Maybe. would you listen to an AI-narrated audiobook? Well, first of all, I don't listen to audiobooks, so that's a terrible oh, question. So that's me. a no. <laughs> <laughs> but as, a, as an audiobook editor, I will tell you, I have concerns about this. Like, yes, mm -hmm. it, it'll make one part easier, but it's not going to make the second part easier, which is editing the audiobook. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. especially with, like, fantasy and science fiction, what is it going to do with, like, the made-up words, mm -hmm. Right. You're going to have Good to go question. back and phonetically spell that out. And also, that how many voices How many voices are available? Are there are there voices that either speak in other languages or speak with the accents of other languages? Mm. I, I have a guess. It's very um, um, English-speaking centric at the moment. Yeah. How would it know unless you told it somehow? But you yeah. haven't and done it. It's, it's pretty – well, I know, I know the answer to your question. There are some voices in different languages and there are accents – um, from but, but do you think you can tell the AI, okay, this voice should have a Spanish accent and this one should be that's, French? And that's I mean, maybe. I like, yeah. I just, as someone who's used some AI voice stuff, like I would be okay with the author training the AI in their voice and then having it produce the audiobook from the text. What I don't like is the made up voices that who knows where they came from, whose rights, whose voice that actually is. Because again, yeah. most of these AI voices are based off someone's real voice. It's and and that was a that hesitation person. of mine, just like we've talked about um, scraping for graphics and scraping for uh, producing samples of writing. I, I had the same misgivings about that as well. Scraping somewhere and stealing mm -hmm. someone's, if that's the case, I can't really support the idea yeah. get behind it. I think, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are definitely tools out there that you can use to like uh, for example, one of the programs I use to edit podcasts is called Descript, and you can train it uh, to make an AI model of your own voice to fix like small mistakes. Uh -huh. That like, and I like sort of that model than just a random voice. I don't know where it's coming from. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and also, there is there is truly an art to a incredibly well produced audiobook, like with like mo either multiple narrators or one of those great narrators who can do all different kinds of voices. And I just feel like there are some things like with all art that like, yeah, it might be easier and it might be cheaper, but it, I feel like it takes away from the magic that is an audiobook, which is really like someone reading to you. Do mm -hmm. you want an AI voice reading to you? If you're okay with that, then go ahead. But like, I like to know it's a real person. Yeah, it doesn't sound warm to me. At the same time, I know, for instance, uh, you know, my youngest, Ralph, does listen to audiobooks, but he listens at them at one and a half, sometimes two times speed, because he thinks audiobook narrators talk too slowly. And if you're already listening to somebody who's talking, you know, really fast, how much worse can an AI? <laughs> I mean, even if it's a human being, you can't tell it at that speed, right? So, yeah. That's all true. right. Okay, DJ Jesse, cue up that music for us. Let's talk to Stephen Joseph. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for joining us. Okay, we've got a standard first question on this podcast. If you could offer writers one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, I, I have lots of advice, but... Uh, <laughs> but one. You have to one. pick one. <laughs> so, oh, no, there, there's... Uh, there's uh, I want to give two. Uh, <clears throat> a really, really best one. <laughs> best yeah. one. The best one is, you know, people always ask you, uh, like where they say, oh, you're not going to make money writing books. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and I always tell people when you write, uh, and, and my response to that comment is that I'm making me. Uh, I have to make me. And, and when you're writing, you're making yourself. And, and really having that, uh, if you're thinking about, I'm just doing it not to make me, but to make money. Well, why are you doing it? You're making yourself. So, so that that's I think that is the, probably the most important uh, thing for a writer to uh, 
to focus in on because you're creating mm -hmm. uh, and, and making yourself. Wow, it's it's pretty good when you have all these books, you know, that you never thought would happen, and now you created these books. So that that would be my first one. I have others, but but that would be mm -hmm. my one. You want me to give you one? Okay. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I it's totally on me. I made you carve it down to one. So yes. And I know you've written many books too, but tell us about Cranky Superpowers. What's that all about? Well, it's a follow. Uh, so I have a grown-up guide to effective crankiness, the crank it source method, and it I followed like up Jesse on the cover. Show us that again. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> okay, I still think it's Jesse, but whatever. Maybe okay. I don't know. <laughs> so, so cranky superpowers is the follow-up book to that, and uh, the the first book is how to be effectively cranky. Uh, and I call it, you have a, you do know, we need a book for that? <laughs> yes. Oh, you said effectively. Effectively, effectively yeah. cranky. So, <laughs> so plain and ordinary cranky. And, and, I, and I talk about in, in that book, like you, you, you know, you think about it, you walk into, let's say your grandmother's home and they say, Oh, William, Laura, take off your shoes. I just paid $25 <laughs> for this rug. I don't want to make the drug rug dirty. And you take off your shoes. You're respectful. But what we, we let out of our mouths sometimes, it's like <laughs> puking on each other. So so being you might be cranky and you're saying things that it's not really thoughtful. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's where it, it all starts. Mm -hmm. Cranky superpowers is more uh, about uh, really funny stories that have a message about how you use your crankiness uh, to create your own superpower. Uh, so uh, I take a, a lot of different stories. I do Cinderella, where she does not get the horse, the beautiful dress, the carriage, the slippers, whatever. She gets a megaphone. And she gets cranky because she's expecting the dress and all that stuff. But with the megaphone, she finds her voice. Uh, so uh, I have the three little pigs, Inky, Pinky, and Stinky. And they're all going to university. Uh, Inky and Pinky didn't turn out too well for them. But Stinky was in class and was watching a lecture putting lipstick on a pig. And Stinky was saying, what a stupid topic for a pig. Why would they, they want to put lipstick on a pig? Ugh. And Steve started daydreaming and came up with the idea of a brick house when thinking about how much fun is playing the mud, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, and took care of a big bad wolf that way. And they named the town stinky town after him, <laughs> which was, which is really good. Uh, so I have, uh, uh, I have Crankosaurus menopause, uh, <laughs> chapter, uh, and, uh, I talk about my own relationship uh, where uh, where I say in our relationship, you're allowed to be 20 percent crazy, 5 percent normal, but uh, no, 5 percent insane, but 75 percent normal. And the, the thing about that, you might think this is crazy, like 20 percent crazy. And yes, like 72 days. It's over two months. Oh, I can't do that. But the, the thing, it's counterintuitive because if I told you, you're allowed 0% crazy, no crazy for you. So when you become crazy, you can't say, I'm crazy. You have to say, I'm not the one who's crazy. You're the one who's really crazy. And me, because I don't like hearing crazy people telling me I'm crazy, makes me crazy. And then we have this big insane fight. So by giving you permission... Wow, I could, and, you know, oh, it's okay you now, it's no problem. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you're crazy, it's like, yeah, you have 20%. You're only using 1%, fine, no big deal. And you end yes. up using less crazy than if you're not permitted to be crazy. So that, that's kind of like, like a thing. Again, your cranky superpower is like almost like a calming thing. Even though you're cranky, it's like, oh, I'm mm -hmm. allowed to be cranky. It's okay. So, and, and even my first book, I talk, talk about uh, crank it source kryptonite, where everybody has their own kryptonite and, and, oh, you're Superman and you're, you know, we're, you know, we're Lois Lane and, and, and Jimmy Olsen. It's like, oh, Superman, that kryptonite thing again. Oh, what meaning? The new superhero. It, it's, it's about like, we all have our kryptonite and, and being empathic about it and giving permission and again, you it allows your super powers to 
come out. You know, so mm-hmm. and it, so I, I just keep coming up with d- different stories and different things that that expose mm-hmm. how when we're cranky we can accomplish a lot. We do when we're feeling cranky. How do we harness that and turn it into a superpower? Uh, notice it. Notice it as an opportunity. Uh, and, and notice if it keeps repeating, if you're having the same cranky moment and, and yeah, this really, you know, sucks, you know, I don't like it. Uh, so that would be a, an opportunity to say, Hey, uh, you know, it's, it's like the, like the, uh, uh, incredible Hulk where it's like ugh, enough of that. And all of a sudden like the muscles start going and, you know, just like, uh, it, it's really, it's really an attitude. And when you're reading the stories, when you're reading so many different stories, uh, it, you know, with, with two books, there's over 70 chapters, and it, there's there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, I, I find the stories are are teaching guides. So, uh, so one one chapter in my my more recent book is uh, hoping for the best crankosaurus and. Mm. Mm. And there, and this is all like, you know, from being an attorney where I hear, I manage our lawyers and we, we hope for this, we hope for that, we hope for this, we hope for that. And, and I retell a story of like, or make up a story where uh, the, the Jewish people left Egypt to go to the land of milk and honey. And there was a brochure that says, please be forewarned while we hope for the best, we've only prepared for the worst. <laughs> so... So of course, you know, they get to the to the Red Sea and, and the Egyptians are coming with their chariots. Where, and where's the cruise ship? I heard your great, great, great grand uncle Noah had this wonderful cruise ship, he even had a zoo on it. Can you imagine that? And no, no, what well we hope for the best, we only prepared for the worst. And oh, do you have a map? No, no, well we hope no map. Yeah. So again, it's it's that attitude. Mm-hmm. Uh Hey, maybe I should start preparing for the best. What can I do to prepare for the best? I have another chapter, just as an example. Uh, can't make this stuff up, crank it source. Mm-hmm. And you, when, and I, in my profession, I have crazy cases where I tell the story. People say, "Oh, you can't make that stuff up," and you can't. You really can't. But when, but when you think about it, and I like turning things upside down, it's more of that rut. Like you, you wake up in the morning and you have the cup of coffee, you go to the bathroom and then you sit in front of the computer and do the same thing you did the last 20 days in a row. And that would be, wow, you can't make that stuff up. Hmm. Of course, nobody hmm. would read it. Hmm. And, and maybe that's the spur you on to be creative and make yeah. stuff up. Hey, you mentioned that you're an attorney, as am I. So I'm particularly intrigued by this quote I found attributed to you. In a negotiation, arguments always take away your power. What do you mean by that? Oh, I mean, that's yes. what lawyers do. We argue, right? I know, I know, I know. It's like, uh, uh, and, and I've written articles uh, uh, on that um, in the New York Litigator. I chair the Dispute Resolution Committee for the American Bar Association, and I talk about that. And I love, I love, I listen to attorneys. We're going to argue this. We're going to argue that. We're arguing this. And, and the thing about that is when you make this argument to the, and like I do negotiation and we're in the mediation. And if I'm making an argument, it's, I don't expect somebody to say, Oh, I'm so surprised. I didn't expect that. I'm going to pee in my pants. Oh, this is the most terrible thing. Oh no. What? what? They, they, they knew that they knew your argument was coming and they're not even paying attention to it. They have the yes to the extent that, yeah, I know my response to that. So I'm not giving you value for that wonderful argument you made. And uh, so it's not that we don't argue. It's how we, we textualize what we're saying. And, and I talk about like, I, I talked about in, like in terms of like the facts, like when I have X, I do Y. When I have this, I'm not arguing with you. I just happened to have a, uh, have a, a, a case this is this I have I have these facts uh, so uh, uh, again uh, when when I'm saying this is what I have this is what I do this is a conclusion I make when I have this again I, I'm taking it out of the argument this like and 
And I also talk about, again, you're getting into the lawyer stuff where I talk about looking at things from a micro standpoint and a macro standpoint. And the micro standpoint is just the, the facts of this case. The macro is a bigger world. And so I move from micro to macro to from the bigger world to, to try to take it out of that argument, saying this is not the first time we had this. This is when we have this. Uh, this, this is how we, we, we act. This, this mm-hmm. is the conclusions we make. This is the position I will have. And you, again, uh, when, when I'm putting in that, uh, that context, so if, if I'm negotiating a case, but it's, I've had the same case 500 times before, I, I can't act in a different way. And that way you can't argue what I've done 500 times before. You have to, oh, Steve, basic. Remember, I remember 235th case before that. You didn't you do something else slightly different? No. First of all, you wouldn't know that. And second of all, my answer is no. I didn't. No. I, I'm being consistent. You've referenced a uh, crankosaurus a couple of times. I think you're maybe uh, referencing your children's books. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so you the first book? book was yes. Yeah, so the first book was the last surviving dinosaur, the Tyranta Crankosaurus. And the word, and not saurus, but saurus. Saurus is uh, a, the Yiddish word, Jewish word for problems. And and uh, so I talk about like, oh, you th- I think you have saurus. If I had you at saurus, I would be doing cartwheels. Nobody could outdo my saurus. <laughs> and, and it's always these 80-year-old women who talk about doing cartwheels, which is kind of funny. But that was uh, it. That was a story about the smallest dinosaur on the planet who kept cranking out her source till all the other dinosaurs vanished, except humans evolved from this tiny dinosaur, the Tyrannosaurus. source. And that's why when you were born, we cry because we're, we're cranky. We, we we come to this planet cranky. So yeah. it's because of that Tyranta crank and source. <laughs> Stephen, one last question: What are you working on next? Well, I, I'm soon to release. Uh, so I have my kid books, my Snoodle series, uh, Snoodles, Cadoodles, Poodles, and lots and lots of noodles, and uh, Snoodles in Space, Snoodle, the Zoodle, Cadoodles, and One Happy Snoodle uh, coming out, Snoodles in Space, Episode 2, The Zoodles Strike Back, which is a take on, on uh, Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, except the, the bad kids. And it's, it's about shaming uh, you know, where like you, you, like you think of a Charlie and Chocolate Factory, where it's like, like uh, the media was there and the TV stations and newspapers and these poor kids, they made the wrong choices and they probably got shamed. And I make them the heroes. Uh, so I have Frumpy Fr- Whiny Woodle. Frumpy Frumpy Froodle has a Fitzy Wissy Papa Doodle and he fits in with and Pop. And, and Wimpy Whiny Woodle has a Swizzly Twizzly Slime Doodle. And first she swizzled and then she twizzled and she turned into a bucket of slime but they become heroes in the end it all works out uh that's great hey steven thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today well thank you for having me okay bye-bye now bye just a few parting words let me remind you one last time about the writer con cruise and i don't mean to be fatalistic but the deadline for registering is fast approaching because the cruise itself is in april 21st to 28th leaving out of galveston and i really hope that you will think about joining us one i can just about guarantee it will boost your writing career two if you're concerned about money and who isn't take a look at the website it is probably way less expensive than you think it is because we've kept this you know our part of it i can't speak for royal caribbean but our part of it is bare bones because i want people on i mean in terms of markup because i want people on this boat listening to people like laura talking about women's fiction or Jesse about audiobooks or RJ about horror and science fiction and Tamara Grantham about romanticy and Catherine Sands, one of the best agents in the business. She was on the podcast just a few weeks ago. She's going to speak to, <laughs> she'll spend an hour with everybody there. I mean, if you want to, she's not going to force herself on you, but anybody who wants to have a one-on-one with her or anybody else can. And that's in addition to over 20 hours of 
instruction, some of it classroom, some of it small group, some of it assuming you want to do this one-on-one, -on -one, which is what I really like. You know, you can give talks at conferences and, and that's fine, but I feel like when I'm really helping someone is when I've actually read their work and maybe marked it up and can sit across the table and talk to them about their book. That's what I really like doing. And of course, that's what we're going to be doing on this cruise and many other things, both work and fun related. So please consider joining us for the cruise. The website to get more information is writercon.com slash cruise slash and there'll be that'll be in the show notes too so you don't have to memorize it all right okay until next time everybody keep writing and remember you cannot fail if you refuse to quit see you next time <laughs>